The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Virginia Spielman is a well-traveled speaker, coach, and educator on topics including sensory integration, DIR floor time, child development, and infant mental health. She is the executive director of Star Institute for Sensory Processing Disorder in Greenwood Village, Colorado. These talks are made possible through generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.org. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Spielman. Thank you so much. Not quite doctor yet. Um, I've got a couple more months before I get to claim that title. Oh, yes, I'm so yes. <laughs> almost there. Yep. I'm so delighted to be here, though. Thank you so much for asking me to participate and share some of the things um, we've been studying and learning about at Star Institute for Sensory Processing regarding how sensory processing intersects with autism and the autistic experience. We are students of this, we continue to study this, and we think that there's a lot to be learned on this subject. So we're looking forward to sharing this with you today um, and um, hopefully making sense to those of you who are parents and those of you who are professionals. And I know we have a mix here, and so I've tried to really aim the presentation to meet both of your needs. So sometimes I'm going to go to slightly different directions, but I'll keep coming back to essentially sharing the basics of sensory processing and integration. And again, how that impacts the experience, the quality of life, the lived experience um, of individuals on the autism spectrum. I did want to just mention that Dr. Miller did a uh, webinar and Dr. Lucy Miller is the founder of Star Institute for Sensory Processing. She's my predecessor. I'm very honored to have worked with her. She did a webinar on this same subject. Um, it's, uh, it's on the same web page as this webinar will be posted and I've deliberately not covered the same things as Dr. Miller did so that you have some variety. And she really looked at the research that's come out of Star Institute around sensory processing. And so that's a great webinar to complement this one, I hope. But first of all, let's just establish what sensory processing really is. It um, used to be something that was very controversial. It used to be something that people would question. What we know um, without a shadow of a doubt is that it is an aspect of human function that every living thing processes sensations. And so sensory processing is really just the neurobiological processes of how we use what we sense to make sense of the world. And it's as simple as that. When you wake up in the morning and you open your eyes and you feel the sunlight on your face, you are processing sensation. You smell perhaps the coffee and that's what wakes you. Perhaps you wish you could smell the coffee and you have that memory of smell, that's all sensory processing. The touch of a loved one as they wake you up, your feet as you twist around and put your feet on the hard floor or the soft carpet, or are they cold? What is it that you feel? That's sensory processing. And it impacts every aspect of life. If you think of a domain of human function, sensory processing supports that domain and that aspect of development. So just to start us off on the right foot, sensory processing and integration really describes the mechanisms of how we feel. And of course, how we feel changes everything. And sensation and emotion are very, very difficult to separate. And you'll see that as we go through this presentation. And so classically, we get taught about five sensory systems. And um, hopefully those of you who are familiar with sensory processing and integration are aware already that there's more than five. We want this to be taught in classrooms. We want our children to know this. There are the classic sensory systems that we're aware of. Vision, taste, smell, hearing, and touch. And of course, they all have more to them than we, on initial first glance. Um, the visual system contributes to our ability to move, our ability to stay upright in space, our ability to read, our ability to remember things. 
and of course judge safety and stay safe and that's the same for all sensory systems their first job is to keep us alive um, the auditory system also of course contributes to our ability to move and, and make a plan for action in the environment and i say that because we think of auditory um, the auditory system and our hearing system very often as you know can we can we hear sounds but we also need to be able to locate sounds we need to be able to understand the temporal qualities of sounds so um, how far away is something how quickly is it approaching geographically what position is it in and so sound contributes to our ability to create responses to things that are going on around us and inside us as well uh, and then of course touch touch is a hugely affective sense it is wired into a lot of parts of our brain that support the development of attachment and relationships and so on it also lets us know about our body map in space it lets us know about um, where we are um, in the world and it lets us know again about safety but it isn't just touch it's there's all sorts of sensations in the cutaneous sensory system so really just pointing out here there's these five systems we learn about i keep wanting to say they all have more to them than meets the eye but the problem with using a sensory analogy is it sounds too narrow they all have more to them than we might initially think and then there's other systems there's our vestibular system which we're going to talk about which helps us stay upright against gravity um, understand where our head is in relation to the pavement and understand linear acceleration and movement in space. There's our proprioceptive system. And so that really, as you can see from this great image, helps us understand force generation, how, how soft or how hard we might want to do something, or you can boil it down to how quickly or slowly we should contract our muscles, flex and extend and so on. And we'll talk about those receptors in a minute. And then there's our interoceptive system. And that is our sense of internal well-being, which we'll talk about a little bit. But again, each of these sensory systems is incredibly complicated. Each of them at least could fill a one hour webinar. In fact, as I'm well aware, you can do your entire PhD on this and still not be finished with learning about how it supports human development. So the vestibular system, as I said, it helps us understand where our head is in relation to the ground. So it's hugely important for keeping us alive. It helps us organize our eyes in space. And so the vestibular visual systems work together um, very closely and have a lot of joint functions. It helps us activate our postural muscle muscles so that we're staying upright against gravity and uh, responding to shifts in equilibrium and so on. Um, of course, it, the vestibular system has to work with other systems, proprioceptive system, the tactile system, to achieve really dynamic postural control, but it's very, very key for that piece. And it's also the system that a lot of other sensory systems are wired to. And so it's a little bit of an air traffic control system for us. And so challenges with the vestibular system, if we go there already, can create uh, impact function through multiple domains and can cause anxiety, can look like anxiety. So the vestibular system is hugely important to understand. It's located here just in the, in the um, inner ear, the mid ear, the inner ear, and it's, there's these semicircular canals here that have fluid inside them and they're like a spirit level um, or a level in America, I think you just call them, that that liquid inside lets us know where we are, again, in relation to the pavement and also how we're accelerating, how we're moving in space. So imagine the impact of movement on that liquid in the air. We also have a gel in there um, with crystals on top of it that lets us know about up and down movements as well. Um, in a separate part in, in this part here. And so lots of very important pieces of information coming from this um, invisible, really, sensory system that's deeply embedded um, in, the, in there and does a lot of work for us. Our proprioceptors, 
as I mentioned, they um, tell us how fast or slow to contract, flex, extend our muscles. Those receptors are in the joint spindles, the muscle spindles, and in the deepest layers of the cutaneous of the skin. Um, and they, they will get a lot of input when we have compression on our joints or traction on our joints when we move. And it is through our proprioceptors that we know in the dark where our hand is, that our arm is bent. And so we can organize our arm in space to reach that light switch. We know the distance we need to stretch, those sorts of things. Proprioception really helps us with those. It is how we know how fast or slow or how hard or soft to open the drawer, you know, the sticky drawer. We get a proprioceptive memory of that. We use that feedback. It is also when we pick up a child who is um, lighter than we think, right? You've all done that or picked up a box. It's lighter than we think. We pick it up with quite a lot of force and then we adjust very quickly as we get that input that, whoa, I'm going too fast and we slow down. So proprioception also very, very important for movement, for producing adaptive responses to the environment, to challenge and activity, to the world around us and our internal experience. And what we often call these responses, these adaptive responses, are, is behavior. And so these sensory systems come together and they help us produce these behaviors. And these behaviors can be adaptive or maladaptive according to how our sensory systems are working, according to how we're being supported in the environment. Our interoceptive system, there's a huge amount of research coming out about this now, is hugely important. We can also have challenges with sensing our internal well-being. And you can see here, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, the, the, the breadth of information, the depth of information we get interoceptively. And imagine how this impacts producing those responses to the world, to our internal systems, producing behaviors. Um, and so we, you know, are we hungry? Are we full? Are we thirsty? Is our gut moving? Um, oh, what, how's our heart rate? That's a big one. Um, and so on. How, what is our internal sense of well-being? How are we able to respond to that? Are we able to filter it out as unimportant when we need to do something else? Lots and lots of things to think about with the interoceptive system needs attention and is getting some good attention. So we are these sensory creatures and in child development, the sensory systems, that sensory processing and integration as it develops and come on, comes online, it's everything in the first um, months of life outside the womb, but also in utero, it's very, very critical. Um, we are sensory creatures even in utero. You can see how this development comes online really early. And I point this out because um, it is how we learn to be in the world and develop sense of self and sense of agency. It is through feeling and giving meaning to that feeling. And that fundamentally requires and depends on sensory processing and integration. We are sensory um, creatures before we are anything else. Um, and those eight sensory systems that we talked about must come together um, to help us develop gross and fine motor control, interpersonal competency, academic aptitude, vocational capability, um, sense of self, as I said, sense of agency, quality of life, and the ability to produce adaptive behaviors, adaptive responses. Now, there are, there are differing models of sensory integration. Um, there are models of function, which I've listed here, just for your information, really to point out that there are people, there's no such thing as the perfect model of human development. I think Thielen said that, and I couldn't agree with her more. Um, and so people have captured different aspects of sensory integration in, in different ways. And you can see these theoretical models of a sensory integration here, function, and there are models of dysfunction. So we're gonna look at a little bit of both. Um, 
the Bundy, um, Murray and Lane model has just been updated. It's just been re-released and that's really exciting. Of course, I'm going to speak from Dr. Lucy Miller's Nosology from 2007, but again, an updated version. So there are these different models. And so what I've just talked about is how sensory processing and integration supports health and development. So that was a function um, model. So let's carry on with that. Um, what you can see here is these sensors coming together, being integrated, their inputs come together and producing these end products, producing um, adaptive behaviors, um, performance skills, the ability to concentrate. We learn to pay attention in, in, in healthy development. We learn to pay attention through being given opportunities to feel together and to enjoy um, activities that, that are alluring to us, that keep us there, where we're successful, where we experience the just right success or the zone of proximal development. That's how we learn the ability to concentrate regardless of our neurotype. Um, and it requires sensory integration really as a supporting process to organize ourselves, to develop self-control, self-confidence, and as I said earlier, academic learning. And these higher levels of thought and reasoning also depend on this foundation of sensory processing and integration. And so this is how we think sensory processing and integration should be developing regardless of neurotype, I say again, and we're gonna talk about that a bit more. Um, we think this can happen. Um, through thoughtful support, through thoughtful intervention, through environmental adaptations, and so on. And so these eight sensory systems need to come together. They build our conscious reality, and they help us produce this adaptive response. What we know from research, and this would have to be a part two webinar to really summarize the most recent re research, I've chosen some key articles to just go over from the last couple of years but what we know is that every single sensory system in the autistic experience can be impacted and can be impacted differently um, from person to person from individual to individual but the key point here is they can be impacted and they often are in the autistic experience and so we it we need to be assessing sensory processing and integration as a matter of course and adapting the environment as a matter of course and providing evidence-based intervention for sensory processing and integration as a matter of course. Here's another model. This is Dr. Miller's model that could be called a model of function. Um, what we're looking at here is in sensory processing in relationship, in relationship to quality of life. And so this is a really key part of the work we do at STAR, is we think about how these underlying processes, these foundational processes throughout the lifespan, not just in early childhood, but throughout the lifespan, support what Dr. Miller always referred to as joie de vivre, quality of life, joy in life. And you can see this inverted pyramid here, which really represents um, how one way of conceptualizing how these processes support um, quality of life. Flourishing is another word that we can use for this. Often as professionals, we have clients coming to us, adults, adolescents, children, infants, and the presenting problem, the reason for a referral will be something in these purple layers up here. Sometimes this turquoise layer too. That's familiar, I hope to you. Um, professionals there, what I'm talking about. What we're saying when we think about the developmental importance of sensory processing and integration for health is that we have to look down here. A hundred percent of people on the autism spectrum um, have challenges with sensory processing. A lot of the research that's come out looking at sensory processing challenges, looking at sensory processing and integration, looks at one aspect of sensory processing modulation. They look at sensory over responsivity and sometimes sensory under responsivity. But as you'll see in a minute, there's much more to the picture than that. And so 
we're really of the thinking that if you really evaluated sensory processing um, at the whole range of where sensory processing intersects with function, that yeah, we think it really would be um, 100% of um, individuals, autistics would experience um, ch a challenge of some kind or another. And you can see more um, citations here as we go through. So we're gonna talk about this um, a little bit more, but there is just so much research that we could go into that looks at how these two experiences intersect. Now here's the, the um, ever present DSM. And just to show, just to emphasize here how sensory got into the DSM last time, it's not the be all and end all um, book, but it is something that a lot of people rely on. And so it's important to be aware that in the DSM, the way sensory processing challenges were included under autism spectrum disorder really refers just to some aspects of um, the process of sensory processing. You can see, over-responsivity, sensory over-responsivity is there as hyper, and under-responsivity is as hypo, and then unusual interest in sensory aspects. So just hold that in mind as we talk more about what disordered sensory processing might look like. There was an article uh, recently by um, Kilroy and her group, um, Sharon Cermak supported this, and they were really looking at uh, the um, as theory of how sensory processing and integration intersects with autism from the 70s. And they're saying, what does contemporary neuroscience have to say with regards to her theories? And thankfully for all of us, what contemporary neuroscience has to say is that, wow, she was right about a lot of things. There are a few small things that if she'd have had more information would have been different. But um, the the AIRS theory of sensory integration was pretty spot on. Um, another thing that they highlighted in this was how much more research on sensory processing in autism there has been since that DSM was released. And this is huge. I mean, you, you know, what a great visual to show the, the breadth, the depth, the wealth of information that we have now. Um, and so this is um, in not quite a model of, of um, dysfunction, um, but it is a, a visualization. I'm just having a hard time seeing the slides, so I'm going to minimize this. A visualization of some of the areas th that were hypothesized to be impacted for autistic individuals. And so you can see um, this is much more global than just over-responsive and under-responsive. Um, modulation deficits I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, but that's that, that's that piece. Being able to register sensory stimuli, discriminate what it means, is also, was also hypothesized to be included. Um, un understanding the meaning of stimuli, um, and then being able to produce that response, being able to engage, being able to organize the body, understanding your body map, and so on, all impacted by challenges with sensory processing and integration. Um, what we see is that there is a difference from person to person. Every individual is unique in the way that they experience um, the sensory world and that they have unique abilities or challenges. And that's a really important thing to remember because we do often as humans tend to want to make things simple and do the same thing for everybody. But if we're reading current research, current ne neuroscience, we see more and more and more that we cannot do that. We have to take into account individual differences. And so we need to get as much information as we can and we need to work as a multidisciplinary team to understand each individual and what their challenges are. <clears throat> and as I said, there's a lot of neuroscience evidence at the moment um, around sensory registration, sensory modulation challenges, um, but also how it impacts motivation or the ability to produce that adaptive response. Um, and so what we're seeing is this shift in thinking um, where previously 
sensory processing and integration was thought to be peripheral. It was thought to be maybe something that some people, that impacted some people. If sensory processing was disordered, that, you know, for some people it would be beneficial. But even people like Baron Cohen, who has a, had a very strong position on autism as being um, a social cognition deficit, is st they're starting to say, these labs are starting to say, wait, um, is sensory central? Is it um, something that really impacts the ability to relate, the ability to engage with the world in such a way that actually it's a core piece of what's going on in, for the individual on the autism spectrum. And so this paper came out very quietly in 2017, but with a pretty um, significant um, proposal that sensory symptoms are core, that they're primary characteristics of the neurobiology of autism. And um, that they're visible in early development, which um, again, Dr. Miller talks about in her webinar of the same title from 2015. Um, and so you can see them as early as infancy. And now we're starting to wonder, well, you know, can we see them in utero as well, these differences? Um, and that they, these differences interfere with the child's ability to engage with caregivers and to engage with the world in a way that is pleasurable and feels organizing, feels safe, feels consistent for that child. And this is huge. This is a huge thing to consider and very much central to the work we do at STAR. There's a Wi-Fi connection between the brain of the infant and their caregivers that's really necessary for organized brain development. It's how brain, the bra it's the, this is the architecture of the brain, it's how the brain is built. Sensory processing can interrupt that Wi-Fi signal. The world can feel chaotic, unpleasant, unsafe, and the people around us can feel unpredictable, um, uh, poorly attuned, and so on. And this has huge implications for development um, and also how we propose to treat, to support um, autism or the quality of life for individuals on the autism spectrum, which is our preferred way of thinking about it. So let's think about that huge implication. What does that mean if we're looking holistically, globally at disordered sensory processing and what that looks like? So I've talked about this a little bit. This is a, another way of organizing our thinking. This is a model of dysfunction from Miller. Um, uh, from 2007. Here's an updated version of it because in 2007 it did not include interoception and sensory craving was called something else. But here's where we're at right now. I do want to say that Dr. Miller has proposed that this will be updated in the next few years. And so as we get new data, this should evolve. And there are some great evaluations coming out soon from a number of groups. Um, looking at standardized evaluations, looking closely at disordered sensory processing and how it impacts function. We're going to have a plethora of data soon that we are going to be able to use to update this sort of thinking. So that's really exciting. So sensory processing, these eight systems that all are so complex and interwoven, they must integrate, they must come together to give us our experience of reality and our picture of the world, our big picture of the world and where we are in it. How we use what we sense to make sense of the world and our place in the world, okay? Now, when it's disordered, how does it impact function? Well, in a number of ways, we can have disordered sensory modulation. That's this first one here. We're gonna talk about this more. But we can have disordered motor responses. That output can be disordered as well. And so our ability to stay upright against gravity and to have dynamic core control can be compromised. We can have disor postural disorder that can impact so many domains of function, so much of life. Or our ability to produce motor responses and particularly responses to novel experiences, to new things to learn complex motor tasks. A great example of praxis is when you learn to drive or operate a sewing machine 
or use a computer for the first time. Some of you will remember that and some of you it's always been something you've done. But those are praxis tasks. Um, and so those tasks can be impacted by disordered sensory processing all the way through life. So dyspraxia. And so we talk, we'll talk about that in a bit. And also the ability to discriminate what's happening in our sensory systems. Um, and so we have eight sensory systems. Any of those can be impacted in different ways. And that's really important to know. And we can have a hard time judging the quality of a sensory experience, discriminating the qualities of a sensory experience. And that, of course, would impact function in many, many ways. So we can be over responsive to sensation. Everything's too much, too intense, too bright, too loud, too sharp, too hard, too much. OK, um, we can be under responsive. I never quite get enough information to realize what I should be responding to or that something requires a response. Um, and each of the eight systems can be over or under responsive in different ways for different people. So it does get very complicated. And then there's the, there's a, a third very hypothetical subtype here called sensory craving that really needs a lot more research. Um, and there are a couple of different theories around this, but when we talk about sensory craving, what we want to explore is this category of individuals for whom no amount of sensation, regardless of how organized it is, regardless of how tailor-made it is, is enough for them to feel more organized and produce a better response. And they're a very, very small subgroup that need more research. The majority of people with disordered sensory modulation fall into these other two categories, over-responsive, which is where the vast majority of researchers has gone into, and under-responsive. And these can really impact well-being, sense of self, sense of agency. The world can feel, if the world feels unsafe as your baseline, that is going to impact every area of function. You are going to develop sensory anxieties. You are going to develop faulty uh, threat assessment. You are going to have all sorts of challenges here that need to be recoded and rewired through attuned caregiving and therapeutic means, okay? And then we have this discrimination disorder. So the quality of sensations is very hard to determine. I might not be able to differentiate similar sensations. Now that's very important for speech, for example. Did she say, cat or fat? Did she say cap or cat? Right? And these different discriminate discriminations. Is this touch threatening or is it safe? And is it supposed to soothe me? Can I feel my buttons so that I can do them up? Can I feel my shoelaces so that I can do this incredibly complex task of tying a knot and a bow? Um, can I can I feel how hard or soft I need to push on something? All these different discriminations, that, the discriminatory abilities that are very important for producing that adaptive response or functional behavior that we want for our, um, to, what we all want to be able to produce. And then there's sensory based motor disorders. Now, this is really, really big. It's really, really important. Um, but it's our ability to use all that sensory information to produce responses to gravity to the world, to moving around us, in order to move in space, in order to be ready for movement, in order to be ready to respond to something, my posture needs to be able to anticipate, needs to be dynamic, I need to be able to rotate my trunk, I need to be able to organize my eyes. A, a lot of our children are not able to do this well and are having a really hard time with this. Um, and so, throughout neurotypes in our classrooms if you go in you will see children using strategies they'll be propping themselves up on the edge of the table with their elbows or their ribs they'll be wrapping their legs around their chairs they'll be standing they'll be sitting funky they'll be rocking all that neural real estate that children with disordered posture are using to stay upright and sit still and listen means that they don't have neural real estate, they don't have brain space available for 
executive functions, academic learning, and those sorts of things. And so this is a big thing that we need to pay attention to and is very much impacted um, in many individuals on the autism spectrum. And then we also have this thing called praxis, which I just talked about, which we break down into the ability to generate an idea, the ability to see the opportunities in the environment, ideation, the ability to make a plan and sequence and organize that plan, and the ability to execute that plan, the motor output being coordinated and successful, and then adjusting it based on success or lack of success. Any of those areas, people can have a challenge in praxis. But we have this sense of flourishing, this sense of quality of life that is so important for um, our clients. And this is really the outcome, right? This is what I talked about, joie de vivre, quality of life, sense of self, sense of agency. I engage in the world because I want to, because I enjoy people, because I can, because I know how. Um, and, and that's the ultimate goal of any support for any individual. And we shouldn't forget that just because we're supporting an individual on the autism spectrum, and um, where the, a lot of these theories of, um, you know, uh, social engagement and so on, which are being questioned now, have, have sort of moved us away from remembering this, perhaps. Um, we, want our, we want our clients, we want our peers, we want our family members to flourish, to experience this, this beautiful thing called eudaimonic well-being, um, which comprises of autonomy, competence, interest in learning, goal orientation, sense of purpose, resilience, social engagement, caring, and altruism. This comes from the Office of Economic Cooperation and Development, and this is a proposal that if you're gonna measure the progress of a nation, you need to look at the eudaimonic well-being, among other measures, of their population. But this also, to me, describes what we should be doing with our clients, with our family members, with our friends, is supporting eudaimonic well-being. And it's always been a part of the star frame of reference. Dr. Miller called it joie de vivre. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do, and I believe this is very much in keeping with the way Jean Eyre's intended sensory integration to be applied, is supporting this outcome through these complex processes of sensory integration. You know, previously we used to talk about um, high functioning and low functioning. We used to talk about if an individual has sensory integration dysfunction or not. It was very binary. And we talk about that as a spectrum, but that's not really what a spectrum is. A spectrum isn't binary and it isn't uh, linear. Um, and this is a lovely demonstration of that, uh, illustration of that from Rebecca Burgess of what, a spec what we mean when we, when we think about sensory processing in our individuals, that are our friends, our colleagues on the autism spectrum, we need to really think much more dimensionally. And so a spectrum looks much more like this, okay? And this is from her lovely comic strip that I've cited down there and I really recommend you take a look at. Um, but where, different, different, where do we map these different areas? How are they looking for any, all of us, how, how do, how, how, is this a strength, is this a challenge, how can we support that, and so on. And if we think truly dimensionally, um, when we think about sensory processing and integration, it means we're mapping each of those areas in the nosology. It means we're looking at modulation and praxis, posture and discrimination. And that means we need a really good assessment and we need really good knowledge to be out there. I also really like this uh, conceptualization of the autistic experience as the autism constellation. Um, I've adapted this from the autism book from 2019. Um, and this has been inspired by an advocate. Um, what this really proposes is that there are di these dimensions intersect they interact and they vary from day to day. And that's really important. And so the autism constellation is shifting and it moves. You can find patterns, but one of the most important things you need to be able to do is become a detective. What's going on in my sensory systems today? What's going on in the sensory systems of this child I'm supporting today? Because if this child didn't have enough sleep or this adolescent or this adult, 
if they didn't have enough to eat, if they had a really rough morning, if they were late getting in the car, if mom or dad is on a business trip, all of these things will impact this shifting constellation of sensory processing and integration. And these dimensions will interact differently. And so the child comes to school one day able to really access those higher regions of the brain, the frontal lobes, and engage in some nice response inhibition and concentrate on some work. And then the next day, gosh, they really need to move. They're finding it hard to sit still. And if we take this kind of constellation approach to thinking about sensory processing dimensionally, then we can see um, that we shift in our evaluation, in our um, assessment of what's going on. So this sensory domain becomes very, very important. Sensory health becomes a central piece of the work that we do, especially for individuals on the autism spectrum where it's so widely shown and talked about as a central aspect of the experience. And so really, sensory health is this bridge that between physical health and mental health that we have to consider in every evaluation and everything that we do. And so I'm very quickly just going to sh share our recommendations for intervention, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Because people do want to go here often, even though a talk is um, you know, supposed to be an overview. People want to know, well, how, what do I do? Well, what we really believe neuroscience is showing and interpersonal neurobiology and so on is that intervention should be respectful and it should support that um, that joie de vivre, that flourishing through being um, process based, relationship based, always honoring the consent of the child, never forcing anything on a nervous system when it's not ready or when it's dysregulating um, through supporting success and being playful. Play is such a great dynamic way to do this work. There's emerging evidence that air sensory integration is very effective for this population. Um, and the star frame of reference is, uh, has fidelity to air sensory integration. The star frame of reference only differs in some of its emphases are a little bit more on relationships and regulation, trying to help therapists with that kind of art of therapy, that use of self peace. DIR floor time also has emerging evidence. Developmental approaches um, are great. Um, what we're looking for is that, that support for the child, um, the therapist intervening in aiding, assisting, modifying, suggesting, bringing out of the child that which he cannot quite bring out by himself. And doing that through a really robust understanding of the mechanisms of sensory processing is pretty critical. This uh, paper just came out, and I haven't managed to get my hands on it yet, but it's pretty exciting um, looking at different interventions and what, how they're going to support children. In the abstract, it says, when effect size estimation was limited to studies with randomized controlled trial designs, evidence of positive summary effects existed only for developmental and NDBI um, intervention types. And so this is really important to, to think about how these developmental um, and uh, naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions are really the way to go. Um, as we learn more and more about the brain. And then there was also this great chapter that's very, very new that just really talks about well-being and happiness. And this is a, this is a key for the work that we're doing. And sensory processing, I would like to propose, supports this work um, in a huge and central way. Of course, there are other things we need to do as well as provide intervention. We need to change ourselves and we need to change the world. Um, we need to remove barriers for participation. Knowing that sensory processing and integration is different, we have to provide environmental modifications, accommodations, alter our expectations, question what, we, what really is the goal of the work that we're doing, and change our culture um, to really respect neurodivergent experiences. So thank you very much. I hope we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, of course, I have to just acknowledge again Dr. Miller and Dr. Schoen, um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. All right. Well, thank you, Virginia. We appreciate that. Can you hear me okay? 
I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Well, we do have lots of questions and for everyone who's here, if you have a question, just type it in the question section and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We've got about 10 minutes. So the first question here that I've got, this, this is interesting. This person's asking, she says, my daughter has autism and likes to look at things upside down. What does that say about her sensory profile? Well, it's really interesting to think about that. There's, a, 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 I'll try and give a short answer. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that I would want to just wonder about is what is her visual experience of the world? Um, and is, is, is the world visually rich and fascinating in ways that neurotypical people can't understand? And so sometimes letting, meeting her in that place and finding the wonder in the uh, the fascinating visual stimuli with her is going to really show her that you see her and that she wow look i can see why you love this um but then also helping her organize herself to what's visually necessary for a response in the world through play and playfully done is going to be really helpful but yeah i would i would say if i'm thinking about her sensory profile that there's going to be some really rich um, visual information that she's getting that's quite different to the way neurotypical people see and experience the world. The next question is about assessment. So about getting sensory, okay. sensory issues assessed. So this person has a daughter who has interoception and sensory issues. What professional would conduct an assessment of that? Um, I, I would say you want an occupational therapist. There are some physiotherapists trained in this as well. There are some psychologists and neuropsychologists, but they should all work with an occupational therapist who has advanced training in air sensory integration. At the moment, the assessment that's being used is called the SIPT, the S-I-P-T. And then for interoception, that's, that, that's not covered by the SIPT. Um, there's Kelly Mala has some great resources. Ke K-E-L-L-Y-M-A-H-L-E-R. Kelly Mala has some great stuff on interoception there. Um, there are more assessments coming out soon, though, that are just going to give us such a wealth of information, and we all can't wait for that. We share this sort of stuff on our website, and there's trainings on our online learning platform as well. Okay, and what's that website? Uh, spdstar.org is just there on the, in the middle of that slide I've got up. Okay, great, great. So one person was asking about what it means to have a sense of agency. So I haven't seen it. Could Great you describe question. that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that question. Our sense of agency is so central to how we function, and yet it's such an abstract concept. But my sense of agency is that I can be in the world and be my authentic self, and I can impact the world around me. And as an adult, I've chosen to do that through really um, – you know, dedicating a, a large chunk of my life to campaigning for people to understand sensory processing better. When I was an infant, I changed the world by dropping a block off the tray of my high chair and having my mum pick it up again. And that was hilarious, right? And then I would drop the block again and my mum would pick it up again. And so before I could get reflective and abstract and become, you know, interested in social justice, I needed to have this pre-reflective experience of agency that meant when I want to move my arm and pick up a block and drop it off the high chair, I can do it and I get a social response and I get social engagement and it's fun. So agency at different ages looks different, but what it ultimately forms is an individual who knows who they want to be in the world and how they want to impact the world around them. I hope that makes sense. It's a pretty difficult thing to summarize. The next question is about the relationship between autism and sensory differences. So they're asking, is sensory processing and integration a cause or a consequence? We know severe sensory deprivation is not a reason for autism. Blind people are not necessarily autistic and mostly mm -hmm. are not. Are any senses more related to autism than others? And then another question relating to that, they, I know you mentioned some genetic components may be emerging in some of the research. Can you touch on that as well a little bit more? Um, uh, can, can I do another webinar? No, I'm really joking. Okay. <laughs> sure, so, of course you can. We'd love that. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first, so I think there were three questions there. One is, is sensory a cause or? A consequence. Um, 
or consequence yeah. uh, are any senses more involved yes. and then the, the, the third part uh, i'm forgetting I it's about like genetics way. right genetic. are there, are there genetic okay. markers that are emerging that might indicate that sensory piece in in autism okay so uh is sensory a cause or a consequence i think is an ongoing question i what we what we see now is, uh, gosh, I've lost count of the number of genes that have been identified as being associated with autism. I've lost count of the number of research articles and, and then news articles that say we found the one single cause. I don't think we're ever going to find one single cause for, um, for autism. Um, I think sensory processing challenges can cause a lot of the disabling factors we associate with autism as a disability and that's huge and really really important and so that's how i would answer that question are any senses more involved than others um i don't think we can answer that question because we haven't evenly researched the sensory systems and i mean there's a massive wealth of research into sound sensitivities um there's emerging research into touch um there's a lot of research coming out about out about interoception and so i think i i i think what we're really being called to now in light of current research findings is a complex view that where everybody is able to think and, and put their sensory glasses on and say what is going on for this child this is complicated let's talk to our multidisciplinary teams let's help this family understand what's going on and let's remember that it that it, it it's very complicated and so that's a difficult answer because we always want something more straightforward than that but it just isn't it isn't a straightforward part of human development there is uh, a little research coming out about genetic markers um, some involved more in the sense disordered sensory processing side than than in the autism side if you look at research that's come from Elisa marco um, e l y s a m a r c o there's some work on genetic markers there that's very interesting um, but again, there isn't going to be a, a nice, simple, neat answer as much as we all want that. And we, it, wouldn't it be lovely? Yeah, yeah. We'll, get, we'll have to keep working on that funding. We'll, we'll do that here. Yeah, there you go. Right, yeah. right. That's exactly right. Okay, so uh, the next question is about if you're going to develop a study about craving, so people who crave mm -hmm. sensory input, because mm -hmm. you talked about um, people mm -hmm. who, are, who have low and sort of high, high uh, mm -hmm. sensitivity. What would that look like? Oh gosh, um, we haven't written that study design yet, but let, okay, so we, what we've got is we've got a very small number of children that we've seen, and you know, we haven't really looked at this uh, robustly throughout the lifespan yet, um, for, for whom generally what you can do is you can find the sensory input with the right amount of detective work, the, a good enough evaluation, and then um, application of that information you can find the sensory lifestyle that's going to support a child to function well and to achieve their full potential um, for some children no matter what sensory input you provide they want more and they become decreasingly organized over the day sorry that's i'm sure that was a double negative um, so i think the first thing to do would be to identify this group we'd have to have a huge sample size and then we would need to just say yep this is a thing um that's the first piece and then it would be okay is this a faulty addiction cycle what's this to do with how are we therefore going to build a self sensory lifestyle that supports function for these individuals all right well i think we have time for one last question so i'm going to try to get a couple of people's questions into the same question <laughs> so this is about <laughs> so I got questions from people who have kids who engage in self-injury or who do, you know, mm. things that might actually injure themselves or have self-harm. Mm -hmm. And then I got questions from people who have kids who are hugging people in public and walking around and, and wanting to talk to everybody. So can you talk a little, just a little bit about those different sensory profiles and where people can find more information to know where their loved ones fit? Um, so, so just quickly, preface this by saying so stimming and and stims 
have very uh, multiple uh, causative factors. And, and what we're finding is that a lot of stims are really organizing, helpful, beneficial, feel good. And if you take them away, um, there's usually a sensory route there. And if you take the stim away, then a, a more powerful behavior will emerge. Um, and often one that is le even, even more maladaptive. And so um, when, we're, when we're dealing with those sorts of behaviors that are um, com seem compulsive, seem like this, you know, impulsive, this, this, this individual really needs to do this to feel good. We have to try and identify what the sensory root of that behavior is. And if there's, if there's a self-harm component or a self-injury component to it, if it's absolutely harmful, a, a really good analysis of, uh, uh, is this covering up for something else? Is there pain? Is there, sometimes there's deferred pain. Uh, some, some tactile defensiveness, for example, can feel, touch can feel painful. If touch feels painful, what can we do to minimize and mitigate that so that we can provide uh, behaviors that are organizing and not harmful, soothing and calming for this, for this person? Um, if we're seeking lots of hugging and deep pressure, and we're doing that through hugging people in public, is there a sensory route to that? Is there more to it? But what are other ways that we could meet that need but keep that child safe? right? Because st hugging strangers is not safe. And so we're being detectives in this way. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, and so how can we support that? Again, I would have try and have a really good evaluation. Um, there's lots of online trainings available. Um, the, our online learning platform is this last link here. Um, and just continue to be detectives. Okay, and, and on, on, on this day this worked and today it's not working. What can I do to help this? There are some nice resources. There's snug vests, there's lycra. Lycra bed sheets are great weighted lap pads. How, what's going to work for this lifestyle to support this individual? And what can we do to give them choice over meeting their sensory needs? And how can we normalize this conversation? Because every kid in the classroom will benefit if there are sensory accommodations available for more than just one child.